Hey there, everyone. Today we're going to be in the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Now, in the beginning of the chapter, uh, we see three men who have been taken from their country, placed in a new culture, uh, given these high-level government jobs, and they serve the most powerful king of the day, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And this king has created this massive golden statue that he's commanded everyone, when they hear this type of worship music playing, that they're supposed to bow down and worship the statue. So not only are they supposed to worship this statue, this just a statue, but it's a statue of a man, and they're supposed to worship this man like he's a god. So these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, couldn't do this because it went against their faith. And when it gets their principles and their, their faith and trust in God and what God has commanded us to not bow down to any graven images and to worship idols. So they had a choice to make. They had to compromise or they had to refuse and face the consequences. So we're going to pick up in verse 8. And in verse 8 to verse 15, it says, Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you and do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? So immediately in these verses, they feel the pressure to comply to the ways of the world. These men were being maliciously accused uh, by a group of people called the Chaldeans. Now the Chaldeans were natives to the region of Babylon, so they hated Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, number one, because they were Jews, and number two, because they were Jews placed in a high level of authority. So these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are being persecuted because of their race and because of their religion. And they're facing these oppositions simply because of who they are and what they believe, not the impact that they're having. So they felt a lot of pressure to portray their, their values and their convictions. And they had to make that choice right then and there. Uh, so the king gives them uh, a redo. And he says, well, we're, we're going to give you a second chance. And if you'll just... We'll, we'll reenact everything. We'll do, it, we'll do it as if we're hitting the rewind button and hit play again. And if you'll just bow down, we'll call everything good. We'll sweep it under the rug. All you have to do is bow down and compromise your values, compromise your faith, betray what you know the truth is to be, and we'll call it good. But if you don't, no man, no God is going to be able to save you from my wrath. And, and that's a big accusation from a big, powerful person that can be scary and be intimidating. Uh, during World War II, there was a United States Army corporal named Desmond Thomas Doss, and he was a combat medic. Uh, what made him unique is combat medics at that time would take uh, weapons. They would take uh, a weapon to defend themselves and to kill the enemy as they were uh, giving medical attention to wounded soldiers. And he refused to carry a weapon. 
because of his personal beliefs as a seven-day Adventist, uh, he said it was against his religion, against his faith, uh, to kill people, whether they were considered uh, enemies or not. And he faced a lot of pressure and a lot of opposition uh, when he took this stand. And he had a choice to make. He could either go with the flow and compromise his, his faith, his beliefs, or he could face the heat. And he chose to face the heat. Now, he was allowed to go into battle with no weapon, and he served his country uh, with bravery and courage. He was twice awarded the Bronze Star uh, for actions that he performed in Guam and Philippines. In the uh, Battle of Okinawa, he distinguished himself by saving 75 men, and he was the only conscientious objector to be awarded the Medal of Honor for his courage and his bravery and actions during the war. Uh, his life is subject to books, docu documentaries, and uh, even the movie Hacksaw Ridge. So if you live your faith in everyday life, it's not going to be if you're going to face pressure to conform to the ways of the world. It's when you're going to face the pressures to conform to the ways of the world. So if you wait until the moment that that pressure is really on you, you're probably going to react in a way that you're, you're going to have regret later. You're not going to react the way that you wish you would or, uh, or the way that your heart says, this is what I should be doing for God and this is the stance I should have for my faith. You have to know who you are. You have to know what you believe and why you believe it before those moments come. If, if your convictions don't run deep, then when you face pushback, you're probably going to fold like a lawn chair. You're going to give in and you're going to have regrets. So look at the response of these men with their seasoned faith. Uh, looking at verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not... Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Their response was quick because it was something that was tempered with seasoned faith. They knew what they believed. And their answer was straightforward and mature and strong. They said, we don't need to sit there and huddle about this. We don't need to get a committee together. We don't need to hash this out and negotiate. We don't need to try to compromise with ourselves and say, we'll bow our knees but not our hearts. They said, our answer is quick. We're not going to bow down because God is able to save us from even you, the most powerful person in the world. And even if he chooses not to rescue us, even though we believe he will, even if he chooses not to, we're going to take a stand for what is right. That's a powerful statement of faith. Even if God chooses not to rescue us, we will still face the fire. That's tremendous. These three men believed strongly that God could save them, that he would save them, but their faith wasn't going to be shattered if he chose not to save them. Their relationship with God was so close that they said, God's in control of our life. So he doesn't have to answer prayer or answer our wishes or intercede for us in the way that we expect for him to still be God, still be worthy of serving and loving and having faith and trust in. They didn't want to die. They were hoping for that, trusting in that miracle. But even if God didn't come, they told the king, but even so, if God doesn't rescue us, we will not bow to a man-made statue. You know, there are many believers today that are in the fight of their life. They're struggling and they're hurting. I've got family members and I've got um, uh, friends who are battling cancer. Some of them are battling what the world would say is a losing battle. Uh, the, the cancer's aggressive. It's spread out throughout the body. And these are young people with little kids. It's hard to understand why God would allow this to happen to, to these people, uh, these people who have many years to live, have a lot of have kids to take care of, who would be leaving spouses behind. It would be hard for anyone, no matter what age. 
They're hoping and trusting God for a miracle. Their faith is strong. But it's even stronger than we're hoping that God would take this away. We know that God can take it away, but they say he's still God and we love him and we'll serve him and we know he's going to take care of us one way or another, even if we don't get the miracle we hope for, even if he doesn't answer our prayers the way we're hoping and praying that he will. And that's a powerful testimony to the world. They say God can rescue, but even still, if he doesn't, He's still God. That doesn't mean they don't struggle. That doesn't mean that they still don't have fears and concerns or even doubts. It just means that's the choice that they're making. They know what they believe and they know why they believe it. It just means they choose to trust God, even if it doesn't make sense, even if they don't get the answer that they're hoping for. If you don't get deliverance from the Lord, the kind that you're hoping for, you know, our loving God is still there with you. You read the accounts of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see a God who is there for people, who hurt with people, who wept with people, who had compassion on them, and who would come in and then change their circumstances for the better, work a miracle in their life, do things that they couldn't do with their own strength or leaning on the strength of family and friends. The real Jesus that they got a lot of times wasn't what they expected either. See, when Jesus was walking on this earth and, and, and being among his people, they were expecting a Messiah to come with a drawn sword and to lead them in, in a battle that would free them from uh, the tyrannical control of the Roman government. That's what they wanted, and that's what they hoped for. Instead, they got the Son of God who died a sacrificial death on a cross for our sins. And it doesn't seem as uh, romantic or as poetic or as, or as uh, courageous, but it's exactly what we needed. We didn't need someone to get us free from a, a tyrannical government when another tyrannical government could take over decades or centuries later, we needed someone to take care of our eternity, which is a far more pressing issue. So they didn't get the Messiah they wanted, but they got the, desire, the, the Messiah that they needed. And when we reach out to God, we may not get the answers we want, but in light of eternity, we're going to get the answers we need. God may not give us what we expect for, what we hope for, but he will give us exactly what we need as an expression of his love, his mercy, and his grace. Now, look at the people who get thrown into the fire. Uh, verse 19 through 30 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression on his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was fully heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, and their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste and declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the fire. And the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men, the hair of their heads were not singed, their cloaks 
were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel to deliver his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. The king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the providence of Babylon. So in this passage, verses 19 through 30, look at the many ways that God watches over Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. First of all, the furnace is heated over seven times its normal temperature, yet they're unharmed. The text says, uh, that not only did they survive, but they're, they're walking around. They don't even smell like smoke. Uh, the, the text tells us that the flames were so hot that the men who threw them in burst into flames, even though they're standing outside the furnace. Just that direct contact with that immense heat caused them to spontaneously combust. And here's the best part. The king sees four men, and he says the appearance of the fourth is like a sun of the gods. As believers in Jesus Christ, as Christians of the faith, when we face the fire, we're not alone. God is there with his people. But this wasn't just for his people. Remember, this was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that said, we believe that God will save us from you. He can and he will. But it was also for a king who said, I'm going to try and make you bow down to this image. And if you don't, who, what kind of God is going to be able to save you from me? And that's when the God of the universe shows up, shows out, and says, you haven't met anyone like me. I am the King of kings. I am the Lord of lords. I'm a God like no other false God that man, may, that man has made because I'm the true and living God. You can't put me in a box. You can't limit me. You can't control me. And he just saw this unrivaled God, the creator of all the universe, show up and say, you think you're powerful. You don't know what power truly is because God doesn't abandon his people. I remember as a young youth minister, I was uh, volunteering for a, a youth event that was going to last all night, an eight-hour all-night event, and I had to deal with other youth workers. We banded together, and we decided to share our resources and share our time, so I was in charge of the first four hours of the night, and I would take care of the, the activities, the Bible studies, the, the food, the breaks, the, all that. And they were to take care of the latter half of the night. And they took care of all those things for the last four hours of the night. Well, I plow through my four hours. I'm giving it my all. I've used all my resources, my preparation. Everything I've done is spent. And I go to tag team for them. And they're like, we, we got nothing. And not only that, but to kind of show their immaturity at the time, they said that they weren't even going to try and help. They just wanted to sit and fellowship with their buddies. And I was really hurt. I looked around and no one had my back. And all I could do was trust in God and, and just push through with little to no preparation for four hours. And by the grace of God, we got through it. And it was a blessing and people, people's lives were changed at, at that night. But I learned that I couldn't rely on those people anymore because they their maturity in the faith just wasn't there. Have you ever had those friends that have your back until you really need them to have your back? Those friends that when things get really hectic, you turn around and there's no one there but you. Thank God the Lord is not like that. He doesn't leave us high and dry. I'm thankful that when we really need God, God is really there for us and with us. So when we face the heat, God is there with us because of his faithfulness and his love, whether whether it was a, a sin situation that we put our own selves in that circumstances, it's our own fault, or it's someone else's sin splashing over us, or if it's malicious accusations like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced, he's promised that he would never leave us, never forsake us. He would never abandon us. 
And of all the promises that, that are throughout Scripture, and there are many, God has never broken one, and He's never been so limited that even though He wanted to keep it, He failed at it. God has fulfilled every promise and held every promise for His people. So one thing that really hit my heart during the preparation of this message is everyone, especially people who are struggling with life circumstances, challenges, people who are battling literally the fight of their lives with cancer. What about the people that don't get the treatment that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego received? They face the full heat of the flame. They're hoping that God will deliver and rescue, but for some reason God chooses not to. What about those people? What about the people who don't get to see God intervene, but they still have to face the consequences of taking a stand for their faith. If Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had burned alive, God would still be God. And it would still be the right move to make to take a stand for your faith and say, God's not going to rescue us. You're going to kill us for this. And it's still something worth fighting for. It's still something worth dying for. So I think of those people who are having their faith and trust in God, and they say, God is able to, to deliver me from this circumstance, to heal me from this sickness, to take away this pain. And I believe he will. But if he doesn't, he's still God. He's still capable. He still loves. And he's still got a reason that he chooses not to do it, even though it's a reason we don't understand. God can still be glorified in how Christians handle devastation. Not just seeing God do something miraculous, but see how God works behind the scenes and we still trust in Him. When lost people see how we face the fire, when they see that death is knocking at our door and we still trust in God and we have no resentment or anger toward Him for the way things have worked out, They'll see total and complete trust in God, and it's a reason to praise because they'll say, they'll see that we respond differently because we have faith and trust in what God can do, and we have obedience to Him even if He doesn't answer the way that we hope. One scripture that really comes to mind is Romans 8.18, and it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory of that is to be revealed to us. Now today, I know a lot of people who are struggling and who are hurting and they're in pain. And I don't want to say anything that diminishes that in any way. Your hurt is real, it's, it's powerful, it's hard, it's difficult, those struggles, I don't, I don't want to downplay that at all. And that's not what this scripture is saying. It's not downplaying what your struggle is. It is hard, it is immense, but it's to also show you how much more gracious and wonderful God is. Because compared to the things God has in store for us in, in eternity, the scripture says the things that we go through in this present time are not worthy of comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. So Paul says it's not even worth comparing to the greatness and the glory and the love and the healing and the restoration and the rescuing that God has in store for us. Whether we experience it on this side of heaven or on that side of heaven, it's there and it's promised and it's real. In May 1940, Britain was losing the battle against the Nazis in World War II and there were a lot of British troops that were trapped at Dunkirk and they were trying to retreat and save as many of them as possible. The whole country was in prayer, seeking God, asking him to intervene. And the Nazis have been very good about jamming communications between uh, the, the troops at Dunkirk and London where they were they, they had their head of operations. And but one British naval officer was able to ca cable three simple words to London. And those three simple words were but even so. Because they had made a stand and everyone knew what that scripture meant that they were quoting. It was Daniel 3.18. It says, But even so, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image 
that you have set up. In other words, they were saying, we're praying that God will rescue us, that God will deliver us. And we know he can. We believe he will. But even so, if he chooses not to, we will take a stand for what is right, for what is good, and what is true. So those of you who are facing the fire today, God is able to deliver you. Don't give up faith that he can and that he wants to and that he will. But if, even so, if he chooses not to, he's still a God of love. And the things that you're suffering with right now are not worthy of comparing to the greatness and the glory that you'll experience in God's presence through Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you today just bowing our heads and hearts to the wonderful mercies and love that you give us every day. Lord, I just want to lift up especially people who are sick, who are hurting, who are suffering, and who are looking to you with a hopeful expectation that you will somehow deliver, work a miracle, do something that only you could do that would be undeniably you. And Father, I pray that you would work in their life and answer those prayers uh, the way they're hoping for. But if you choose not to, Lord, because you're God and you are sovereign and you are in control, if even so, if you choose not to, please give them love and comfort and encouragement to know that they're not getting the answer they want, but in the light of eternity, they'll get the answer that they need. Give them that assurance, that comfort, and that hope we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.